Welcome. I'm glad you're able to join with us. We are in the season of all saints for those who celebrate the church calendar when we think of all those who have gone before us in the faith, who have inspired us by their lives and their witnesses. In the book of Revelation, where God shows to John what is and what is to be, there is a point where one of the elders in heaven says, These in white robes, who are they and where do they come from? John says, Sir, you know. And the elder says, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We have some new singers who are going to sing our first hymn. It is recorded at a, a conference for Lutheran young people held in Michigan in 2015 under the auspices of a, a Lutheran um, Christian education organisation called Higher Things and they organise these conferences uh, for Lutheran young people. And we're going to listen to that great hymn, For All the Saints.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. We take time to be still, so that in the stillness we may know that you are God. We may marvel at your greatness, the God who brought all that exists into being simply by a word of power, the God whose eternal arms are underneath us to catch us, the God who surrounds us like a strong tower and protects us from evil, the God who orders our lives, providentially guiding and directing our steps, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we understand something of your great love for us, your compassion at times when we feel our needs. But above all, you are the God who has redeemed us. Your Son took our sin, that we might clothe ourselves in his righteousness. Your Son paid a penalty that was not due to him, so that we might not pay the price of our sins. And for this we thank you, and we thank you too for the gift of your Spirit, that not only does Christ redeem us, he renews us. In him we are made into new creatures. We have a new heart that is warmed in love towards you, a new will that is able to walk in your ways, a new understanding that your word becomes comprehensible to us instead of just dead old words. And we thank you for your presence with us, that you bind us together with all your people in heaven and on earth, and we are part of one great and holy fellowship. And though our circumstances may prevent us from enjoying that fellowship in a human, incarnational way, we are still part of it. And for your presence with us, we thank you. And we ask you that as we take time now, just to come apart from all the busyness of our lives, we may hear your word afresh. And not just hear it, but understand it. And not just understand it, but do it. So speak to us now as we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading is continuing in Acts chapter 16, and we're picking up the story at verse 16. Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke are in Philippi. They've already met a high-ranking businesswoman, and she has come to faith are now rather different events. Acts chapter 16 at verse 16. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned round and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, 
These men are Jews and are throwing our city into uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, "'Don't harm yourself! We are all here!' The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, "'Sirs, what must I do to be saved?' They replied, "'Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household.' Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night the jailer took them and washed their wounds, then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy, because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, Release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison, and now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates. When they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted from them, from them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. We thank God. For his word. Now Sue's going to sing our first song, Faithful One. Oh, 
Every so often when I'm preparing, I read something that makes me stop and think and say, really? Do you really think that's true? And it happened this week when I was preparing the passage we're looking at today, and I read this. It says, because of our particular place in history and because of our Western experience, the story of a woman who was able to tell fortunes and earn money for her masters by fortune telling seems almost unreal to us. And that was from a commentator that I've got a lot of time for. But I thought, really? Do you know, I don't find that a difficult gulf between Paul's day and our day to bridge at all. I think of my ministerial experience from time to time, people who have been bereaved will confess to me that they have gone to seances or similar things in order that they might get some sort of comfort uh, over the loss of a loved one. And if you think back to the good old days of, oh, say, 12 months ago, then if you looked around, you could buy a ticket and go to a pub somewhere and go to the meeting room upstairs and attend an evening of clairvoyance, where someone would purport to be able to get in touch with dead people or to predict the future for you. And just this week we were on the phone to one of our daughters and she was telling us about a friend of hers, a woman in her thirties, educated, affluent young woman, who regularly pays seriously large amounts of money to a so-called medium in order to get private readings. And so such fascination with the future and the idea that certain people can predict the future has always captivated people. And between our so-called sophisticated world and Paul's world, there is very little difference. And so we come to this story of a woman who foretells the future and who gets Paul imprisoned. First, a little bit about this slave and her predictions. We learn from her story never, ever to make the mistake of believing that just because a prediction comes true, its source is a good source. Look at what she's saying. These men are servants of God. That's absolutely correct. That's who Paul and Silas are. She refers to God as the Most High God. That's a perfectly fitting way to speak of God, particularly amongst a crowd of people. It's a biblical title for God. And they are telling you the way to be saved. And that also is absolutely correct. That was the message of Paul and Silas to the people of Philippi. The gospel message everywhere. You need to be saved. I will tell you how to be saved. Nothing, nothing that the slave girl says is the slightest bit false. And we know that. Because as the story unfolds, and she is exercised by Paul, the evil spirit comes out of her, and she is no longer able to predict. And that's a severe financial problem for her owner. Now, this story would be so much simpler if everything she said was false and nonsensical, if she exhorted people to worship Apollo, and if she told them that there's no salvation in Christ. But the very opposite is the case. And so here is the problem for us, or at least here is the problem for some people. There is a gullibility that assumes that just because what a soothsayer says is broadly true, and especially if it is said with some Christian jargon, connected to it, then it should be treated seriously and given our full attention. That's not the case here. 
Paul cast out the spirit that gave her this ability to make true statements. Why did he do that? You get the impression, particularly in the NIV wording of it, that he just got a bit angry that she was constantly going round saying things. Um, that's not really uh, what it means. Um, there were other reasons why he did it. I want to suggest three to you. The first is that the spirit was holding her captive. Uh, she seems to have gone into some sort of trance or something, uh, some turn or other, but goes into another state and she then starts to prophesy and, and she can't really stop herself. She just keeps on and on and on. And she's captive to this spirit, but she's also captive to the financial aspirations of her owner. And, and maybe at a time when slavery is very much in the public mind, you need to remember she was a slave. She had been bought and her owner was delighted that she was proving to be so lucrative with her predictions. The second reason why Paul exercised her is that when predictions, even true predictions, have as their source the evil one, you can basically never trust the statement, the devil is the father of lies. But he doesn't thoughtfully hold up a sign and says, you can't really trust this next statement. Instead, he always mixes truth and lies. Now, one of the clearest examples of that is in the gospel accounts of the temptation of Jesus. And the devil mixes truth and lies in what he says. He quotes scripture. He's very good at quoting the scripture. But Jesus does not need the testimony of the devil or his minions. One commentator, Warren Wearsby, says, Satan may speak the truth one minute and the next minute tell a lie and the unsaved would not know the difference. And that is the problem. Paul cannot have this mixture of good and evil, truth and falsehood being intermingled in what this woman is saying and attracting a lot of interest. And that leads on to the third reason. It was a great distraction from the gospel. It's sad to say that people, including Christian people, get much more excited by and interested in magic shows than they do in the Word of God. You can get a crowd of people in a pub by offering an evening of clairvoyance. You will not get the same crowd if you offer an, evil, an evening of Bible study of Second Timothy. And so, we now meet the second identified convert in Philippi. And she is someone who is at the exact opposite end of the social spectrum from Lydia. But, great though it is to see that she has been liberated, made into a new person, the slave girl's owner isn't going to let the Christian missionaries get off that easy. He uses the age-old rent-a-mob tactic, and drags Paul and Silas into the market square, the public place, and we read in verses 20 and 21, they brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into uproar by advocating customs and law unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Rather neatly, there are three R's to the uh, accusation there. First of all, it's racist. These men are Jews. So what? Secondly, 
It accuses them of revolution. They are throwing the city into uproar. And thirdly, it accuses them of being revisionists. They are advocating customs unlawful for us Romans. And you can hear exactly the same mob reaction that you get in our day. They're foreigners. They're upsetting our ways. They're breaking our laws. Get rid of them. The magistrates don't really behave much better. They decide their best tactic was to punish them first and then organise a trial later on. And don't miss what's going on here. They are preferring to back a slave owner who is abusing this woman for the pursuit of corrupt gain and they are not willing to consider the claims of the gospel. Paul and Silas find themselves in prison. It's not going to be the first time, the only time, it is maybe the first time that's recorded for them. We can take a look at 2 Corinthians 11 and you'll see just how much Paul and his fellow missionaries endured for the sake of the good news. As the writer to the Hebrew says, in a similar but different context, pioneers of faith often go destitute, afflicted, mistreated, and of them the world is not worthy. But alas, Paul's society and our society can write off such people as nut jobs, extremists, not right in the head. There is the view that religion's okay, but just make sure you keep it absolutely private. So, what do you do when your body is hurting from the beating you've just received? When you can't lie down and take some rest because you're chained up in stocks? When you're incarcerated in a pitch black prison in the middle of the night. What do you do? You organize a meeting of prayer and testimony. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. This is a way of living that Paul recommended. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't you sometimes read Something like that that Paul writes and think, I've got an awful long way to go before that is my instinct in troubled times. We've already seen in Acts a couple of occasions in chapters 5 and 12 where in a situation like this, God sent an angel. He doesn't this time. This time it's an earthquake and the uh, frightening events that have taken place in Izmir this past week have underlined to us just how common uh, earthquakes are in that part of the world. And there's a sense in which this is a perfectly ordinary event. But of course Christians understand that even the ordinary can be part of God's extraordinary providence. What follows is absolute chaos. The jailer, who knows that the penalty for losing prisoners was death, probably preceded by considerable humiliation, decides to save his commander the trouble and commit suicide, only to find that his prisoners had not actually run away but are actually waiting for him there in the prison. He had presumably heard 
that Paul and Silas had been talking about salvation and his mind being considerably focused by all that was going on decided that it was, this was maybe a very good time for him to think about it and he asks how he can be saved. And if you don't know what Paul does, then I've got to say, where have you been for the past 15 chapters of Acts? He does what the apostles always do. He preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ from the word of God. And nothing more grounds, roots, bases that message in the circumstances that are going on, the chaos all around them. And Paul is biblical, he's Christ-centred, and he calls for a response. And that is the church's task. And the jailer makes a clear commitment, and he and his whole family were baptised. The whole family, one of four households baptised in Acts. And in the world of Acts, households followed the head of the household. None of this leaving off for them to make their own decisions when they're older. Now, this is so amazing. Paul and Silas have headed into Europe, completely new territory. And the first convert was this leading businesswoman, Lydia, but quite possibly not who Paul had anticipated would be the first believer. And then the next believer that's identified to us is completely the opposite end of the social scale, a slave girl who is actually now probably homeless because she's surplus to her owner's requirements. But we need the missionary mind. So much by way of attempted outreach in the Church of the Day, if it exists at all, is aimed at former church members, that's people who've already opted out of church life, or it's aimed at children, and then we let them go as soon as they discover other things that they think are more fun because we don't like to make demands of discipleship. Or we see our main target as being comfortable middle-class people, a bit like ourselves, comfortable middle-class people. Now, comfortable middle-class people need to be saved, but often they have the least sense of that need of salvation. But Paul and Silas seized every opportunity to tell the good news to anyone who'd listen, even if they could only listen because they were chained to Paul and couldn't get away from him. The last section of the story we'll have to wait for another time. But what I want to flag up now is that there was created by this witness of Paul and Silas in Philippi, a good church. All the congregations in the New Testament to whom Paul and John write letters, the church of Philippi was the one that was most commended, seems to be most loved. Yet Paul's initial reaction to what happened was this, writing to the Thessalonians, he says, we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. They were treated outrageously. But they didn't go into the situation with the assumption about who would believe. The first believer, a businesswoman. The second, a slave. The third were told about a soldier hard-bitten, cynical. And of course, there were others, as we learn at the end of the chapter, whom Paul and Silas went back to see and encourage. We're not told about them, 
but the regard but regardless of who these people were and what their background or understanding was there were people with whom paul shared the word of god in the last program i mentioned uh, the characteristics of the bible that the westminster confession sets before us one is the sufficiency of the word of god and that's really where i want to end for today with a question do you think the bible is sufficient to bring about faith in people who hear it you see paul did and silas did timothy did luke did do you think the bible is sufficient to bring about faith in the people around us I have another song now, Come People of the Risen King. Join with me in prayer. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you at any time and in any place, but how we are encouraged to know that there are others who join with us in prayer for the Church and for the world. 
And we pray now for the church, our local church, our denomination, our relationship to other Christians in our town, in our country and beyond. And we ask that as the church in the Western world faces difficult decisions to make, especially in our own experience at the present, we ask that you would give that wisdom you promised to all who seek it in making decisions and an understanding of the calling and the role of the church in the world. We pray that your people may again and again return to Jesus' commission to go and make disciples and to seek ways in which to take that word into the world for his sake. We pray for the world. And as we have seen the injustice of people being unlawfully punished for their beliefs, so we see people doing for or against their beliefs all manner of evil in the world. And we pray that that might be an understanding of your ways. And to that end, we ask for the people of power in the world that they might not seek the false gods of money, fame, and position, but rather seek you, and in seeking you, establish your kingdom on earth as it already exists in heaven. We pray for our own country, for our parliaments, for the First Minister and the Prime Minister and others who seek the best way of leading us forward. May they too humbly bow to you and seek from you that heavenly wisdom. We thank you for all those who are not ashamed of the gospel and are willing to identify their faith publicly in their service, in government, in industry and trade, and just within the local community. Strengthen them, Lord God, we ask. Protect them. May their testimony speak profound truth to all around. We bring our own prayers to you. Lord, maybe we feel the weariness of the continuing situation of the pandemic. Maybe we feel anxiety for our own circumstances or the health of others. Maybe we feel fear because we don't know what a day brings. Teach us, Lord God, that you know what each day brings, that all our lives are in your hands, that all the people we love are under your care, and help us to cast all our burdens on you, as we pray in Jesus' name, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Another victim of the pandemic pandemic is probably going to be bonfire night. I have a neighbourhood friend who, like me, has 
dog, he has dogs, plural. He hates bonfire because his dogs are terrified by fireworks. My dog's not bothered at all. For a few years, I lived in Lewis in Sussex. Now, if you're into bonfires and fireworks and fire displays, Lewis is the place to be. Because on November the 5th, the whole town is taken over by the seven bonfire societies who during the preceding weeks have built huge, fire, and I mean huge bonfires in fields around the town. A bonfire in Lewis is about the size of a house. There are parades through the town. The town's closed off on the afternoon of the 5th and people dress up in all sorts of strange costumes. They carry flaming torches. Fireworks are let off, sometimes frighteningly so, but there never seems to be anything in terms of major injuries. It has to be said that a certain amount of alcohol may be imbibed at some of the hostelries in the town. It is a very spectacular event and if you imagine trying to combine the common riding with Uphelia with pantomime it will give you something of an idea like that. Typically on the bonfires there will be effigies of public individuals apart from one bonfire which always has a particular effigy, which is very controversial. And roughly every third year, there are stories in serious newspapers about whether Lewis should carry on, carrying on the tradition of the bonfire. But it is a great time. As you watch the parade go by, there will come a group of men carrying 17 flaming crosses. And you may think this is something to do with the Ku Klux Klan. It's nothing to do with the Klan at all. It really goes back to the origin of the bonfire. And the origin of the bonfire is a time in English history when Queen Mary was on the th throne, Bloody Mary, and the Protestant religion was banned in England and over a period of about 18 months in Sussex 17 people men and women were arrested for their Protestant faith and they were taken to Lewis which was the county town still is the county town of East Sussex and they were burned at the stake. One fire had nine bodies burned on it. And if you go to Lewis, you will see on the outskirts of the town a monument, a sort of cenotaph, a pinnacle to Derek Carver, Thomas Harland, John Oswald, Thomas Avington, Thomas Reed, Thomas Wood, Thomas Miles, Richard Woodman, George Stevens, Alexander Hossman, William Maynard, Thomasina Wood, Marjorie Morris, James Morris, Dennis Burgess, Anne Ashton and Mary Groves. The 17 Marian Martyrs, they're known as in Sussex, who were burned at the stake for their faith. We may in our sophisticated world say oh well thank God that things like that don't happen but actually things like that are happening in the world not very far away from us things like that happened to Paul and his colleagues things like that happened to three people at worship in a French church just this week. There are those who so hate the living God 
they will turn against any who in any ways bear his name. And in all saints' time, we remember the glorious company of the martyrs who have gone before. Martin Luther lived in very troubled times. The Protestant Reformation brought great conflict and Luther reflected this in his hymns. One of them is a famous hymn, We Know It As A Safe Stronghold Our God Is Still. In America it's known as A Mighty Fortress. It's a different translation of the original German. It's not a very popular hymn in this country. I think that's probably because it tends to be really sung and played a bit drearily. It's a lot more popular in America, but then America has a much more independent spirit and is less conformist than we are. And so we're going to end with that hymn being sung. And of course, you wouldn't expect a group of young Lutherans in their late teens, early twenties to be interested in singing an old chorale written in the 16th century. But you'd be wrong. Listen to the hymn sung with gusto. Thank God for its inspiration. And those of you who've got a keen musical ear, listen especially to the organist in verse 3 of it. May God grant that we can meet again soon. Till then, may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you.